All right, this whole topic in this whole video makes a lot more sense if we break it down into real life examples. I'm sure if you're around my age or older, you've heard of Nokia, the mobile phone company, right? One day, you'll be able to watch videos on your mobile. Nokia, connecting people. I remember getting some of my first mobile phones. Almost everyone would be a Nokia phone. Everyone wanted one as well. I'm sure you probably remember that as well. Whether it was the 5110, which I think was the, the chunky one with the air on top, or later on, probably the most popular, most memorable one was the 3210. Ah, what a phone that was. Although, let's be honest, at the time, at least for me at school, it was hardly used as a phone. It was more of just a device to play, you know, snake on or program in some cool ringtones and text message notifications. I think I can still hear Axel Foley in my head. It's funny, if you look into the history of Nokia, you'll see that they ended up selling 160 million of those 3210 phones. And to put that into perspective, that's one of the most popular phones of all time. Apple in the whole of 2014 sold 169 million in comparison, and that was a few more years later once a smartphone boom had really taken off. Okay, but how is this relevant to holding shares in a company for life? Well, we all know how popular Nokia used to be, but any teenager now or even adults for that matter, aren't exactly playing snake on their phones and Nokia has just kind of faded out of existence. I mean, just check out the revenues of the company over the years and its share price. It's gone from $28 to $5 today. If you bought the company back then when you thought mobile technology was the way forward and that there was no way Nokia was going to get beaten because everyone was using it, you'd be holding some pretty heavy bags right now. Clearly in this case, buying and holding forever is not a good look. So. What's the answer then, as even the most famous investor out there, Warren Buffett, says that his favourite holding period for his stocks is forever. So what are we missing? All right, stock picking's hard. And that's just a fact when you look at how many people fail to beat the returns of the stock market in the long term. I mean, even winning in the short term is hard enough. And you'll see here that last year, even during that amazing run in 2021, 79% of actively managed funds failed to beat the returns of the market. And that's professional teams who do this full time charging lots and lots of money to their clients even when they couldn't find any additional gains. You see, this is an interesting topic this one because on one hand we're always told that you should invest for the long term and hold stocks for a really long time because those who jump in and out trying to time the market get hurt and end up losing money. But then on the other hand, if we look at some of the data and research on this topic, we find that there's actually very few companies that survive for a long time. And sure, Warren Buffett says that his favourite holding period for a company is forever, but even he has to sell some stocks sometimes because, like another saying goes, nothing lasts forever. And this couldn't be more true in the stock market. Just take a look at this. McKinsey did some research into this exact topic and they found that the length of time that a company's surviving is actually getting shorter and shorter. Back in the year 2000, the median average age of a top 10 company on the S&P 500 was 85 years, which I think we can all agree is a decent lifetime. However, just a couple of decades later, by 2018, that average had been cut by more than half to just 33 years. And things don't look to be getting any better for those of us who want to hold a stop for a very long time. They estimate that by 2027, the average time that a company features on the S&P 500 index will be just 12 years. That's not even a teenager. And what happens to those companies that don't make it? Well, some might get acquired, some go bust, some fade away or even merge with another. But either way, we still come to the conclusion that you might not be able to buy and hold companies forever. Just have a look at what happened to the S&P 500 as a good example over the past 20 years. It's almost unrecognisable if we go back to 2002. Here's what the top companies actually look like. Clearly some big names here that have stood the test of time. You've got Walmart continuing to dominate to this day, at least in terms of revenue. You've got the oil stocks and energy. Ford and GM though? Sure, they're still around, but the third and fourth most valuable companies on the list? I mean, how crazy does that sound in 2022? And even making it onto the list in number 10 is Altria. I mean, they sell cigarettes and sure, they're not going to go anywhere fast, but to be that high up, it looks like a totally different economy. Apple's nowhere to even be found yet. Microsoft is 72nd on the list. And of course, we know that companies like Tesla weren't even founded yet. Things change so quickly. If we jump now to 2022, it's completely dominated by technology companies. You have to slide quite far down the list if you want to find an oil company or even further if you want to find a car company that isn't Tesla. I mean, just think about this for a second if you were going to go and pick up a small selection of companies to hold forever right now. Could you imagine that in just another 20 years time, some of them may not even be near the top or that some of them may not even perform as well as the S&P 500 would do on average? It's very likely over the next two decades, a company that might not have even been founded yet could end up being in the top 10 or the top 20 companies on that list. That just shows how fast things can change. You see, here's what's really difficult to figure out. 
We all know how important it is when picking companies to invest in to think about long-term futures. A common thing you'll hear investors talk about is the company's moat. Just a fancy way, of course, of saying, well, how well a company is actually protected from its competition. Is the moat surrounding this imaginary castle, you know, the business itself, quite deep and quite wide? If we look at companies like Microsoft or Apple, we would say that they've got pretty wide moats because they would be very hard to compete with. I mean, for example, if you want to compete with Microsoft, you'd have to create a new computer operating system that's globally adopted, integrate with all the other apps and services, as well as creating a cloud computing platform. I mean, not really quite so simple, and we've not even spoken about the brand of the business or all of the rest of the ecosystem actually goes along with it. However, saying this for companies like Microsoft is easy, but what about entirely new areas of the economy that don't even exist yet? I mean, how are we meant to foresee them? I mean, just consider the whole social media industry. None of this existed just a while ago, and we've also lost plenty of companies along the way. Right now, you've got meta platforms running Facebook and Instagram, you've got Twitter, you've got Snapchat, and then hot new contenders like TikTok. Where some of these companies will be in the next 10 or 20 years is still anyone's guess. I think we're all still trying to figure out where they actually stand and some of them will still need to figure out how they actually become profitable. And these companies are just the winners or at least the ones that have survived so far. If you're around my age or older, you might remember actually platforms like MySpace or even Bebo here in the UK. MySpace is actually still around right now, but it looks like they focus on the new music and bands only or something like that. Whereas back in the day, they were the top dog. MySpace was acquired for $580 million back in 2005 and was actually the single most visited website in the US in 2006. But just a few years later, once Facebook gained more traction, it slowly went into decline. And the thing is, this all happened within the last 20 years during my lifetime. And although MySpace isn't a public company that you can invest in right now, can you imagine if you could have had back in 2005? You would have assumed that it would just keep growing, keep getting bigger, and nobody else could have got close. And on the subject of growing fast, or at least trying to, if you're enjoying the video, please don't forget to hit the like button and leave a comment below. It really helps out small channels like mine. So here's the biggest point that I wanted to explain in this video. We've got to be really careful when buying stocks in the first place, especially individual companies. Not only have we got to do all of the due diligence on the financials, make sure we're paying a fair price and consider the wider industry, We've also got to consider the fact that there might be competition from industries out there that don't even exist yet. So I'm not really sure how you quantify that, but still the point stands. And I think it's highly likely that in the future, as technology continues to innovate, we'll see this happen time and time again. Also, even in an industry that's growing like social media, this doesn't mean that every company inside it will enjoy the same growth at the same time. I think a good example here is the automobile sector as it can help us explain things a little better. You see, as soon as the car was invented and started to really take off in popularity, I'm sure you would have agreed that cars were the way forward and they were only ever gonna become more popular. The problem is, how do you know which companies will be the ones to survive over the long term? It's actually quite an interesting fact that Ford is one of the only legacy car companies not to have gone bankrupt at one part of its life. There's an entire Wikipedia page with a list of all of the car companies that have currently gone out of business and that's just a list for the United States. No kidding, to go from A to Z, you'll have to sit there and scroll for quite a while. It's pretty crazy. And that's not to say that you can't bring any of them back to life though. I did just see that DeLorean, or at least a new company using that name, is bringing out a new electric car soon. Looks pretty expensive to me, but if there's a time to make a new electric car, it's now. So if they get enough pre-orders, they should probably IPO and have a $50 billion market cap. Sounds reasonable to me. Now, with that said, there will always be industries that don't experience a rapid change, and it's definitely possible to keep up with changes. But as you get larger as a company, it's also more difficult to change and adapt to your new environment. I mean, companies like Walmart in the US or even Tesco here in the UK aren't going to suddenly be put out of business because all of a sudden there's a new grocery store downtown. The moat of Walmart is huge. Everything from the economies of scale, its entire supply chain and its brand recognition all have value. But don't for one second think that entirely new ways of doing business can't one day come along and start taking away their market share. Anything is possible. And I think our job as investors is to always remain open-minded and cautious about what lies ahead in the future because otherwise it might be too late by the time we realize that things are changing. Aside from doing your homework and checking in on your individual stocks then, there is a way forward and another reminder that if you don't want to deal with the stress of trying to pick the winning companies, then it's probably best to stick with investing into low cost broad index funds. This is exactly what I do as my own strategy and I try to have the largest part of my holdings in indexes like the S&P 500. And I do this for a couple of reasons, but first, it's an acknowledgement that it's a proven long-term strategy to build your wealth. And secondly, it's because I realize that no matter how much I might think I know or can work out about what a certain company might do in the future, there could be many new companies or even new industries that come along and change everything. If I just own the entire market itself, it will clean itself up. 
Companies can come and go on the S&P 500, but I'll keep dollar cost averaging into it over a very long period of time. And I know there's a strong chance that my money will grow, even though the companies that I start investing in today will probably be completely different ones in 10, 20, and even 30 years from now. We can't control what will happen in the future and neither can anyone else, but we can focus on the important aspects of long-term investing, like saving as much as we can from income, investing regularly, and not buying terrible companies, which is sometimes easier said than done. Anyway, with that said, thanks so much for watching. Drop me a like if you've enjoyed the video, subscribe for more, and as always, happy investing.